786. Hear the difference. The time just gone nine minutes past eight o'clock on the Reflections show. It's now time for Medical Health File in association with the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa. Tonight's topic is congenital heart defects. Now, if your child has a congenital heart defect, it means that your child was born with a problem. Uh, in the structure of his or her heart. We encourage our listeners to be part of our show tonight on the WhatsApp line 0786 10 11 12 or if you'd prefer to call in on the telephone line 0216 On the line, we'd like to welcome our guest, Professor Liesel Zulka. Good evening, Professor, and welcome. Good evening. Thank you very much for having me. Only a pleasure. Um, listeners, a uh, very important topic. Uh, so do be part of the show and let us know any questions, queries you may have. Professor uh, Liesel, maybe unpack for us very quickly. What exactly is um, congenital heart defects? Yes. Um, so essentially what we're saying is that a baby has been born with a heart defect. You can develop heart defects late or heart disease later in life. Um, but this is when you're actually born with a structural defect of your heart. So your heart is consists of four chambers. You've also got four valves. And then you've got, of course, pipes leading um, to the heart and taking blood away from the heart. And if there are any problems in any of that type of phenomenon so either you have got holes in the wall separating the different chambers or a problem with the chambers or the valves or the pipes leading to and from the heart those are called congenital heart defects Uh, we know that it affects at least um, around one in a hundred children and it is the most common birth defect. So if you think about things like cleft lip and palate or you think about being born with less than five fingers and five toes, this is more common um, than that. So it's a particularly important problem. Mm. How much of a problem is this with regards when babies, you know, experience this or or young kids experience this? I mean, um, is this something that can be resolved, um, you know, through an operation or a procedure or medication? Take us through that. Yes, so quite right, as you say, this is a significant problem. As I mentioned, one in a hundred is sort of the number that we use. And so you can imagine if one out of every hundred babies are born, that's a significant number. If we think it's probably about two to three thousand in South Africa per year. Um, Of the children that have congenital heart defects, probably about 20% of them have incredibly serious or even critical congenital heart defects where you need either an operation or you need some kind of intervention to um, to reverse the particular problem that you have. But again, on the other hand, 80% of them are smaller defects and some of them will even resolve on their own or can easily be amenable with either surgery or intervention. For us as doctors working in this area, the most important is to try and diagnose those critical defects or the very complex defects because if we don't diagnose those early, they obviously are Mm, life-threatening. And so that's where we try and focus our major attention. And I would say probably about 95% of all defects, be it serious right down to the simple ones, can be addressed. However, if you don't diagnose it early, then obviously complications may set in and then that will stop you from being or stop us as practitioners from being able to address it if we diagnose it too late. Mm. So the onus really is on being aware that this is an issue and making the diagnosis as early as possible so that we can put in the intervention that is required. Those are staggering numbers that uh, come through our, our hospitals every year of, you know, kiddos uh, experiencing a congenital, congenital heart defect. Are we are we prepared to handle those numbers? Um, you know, have we coped? Uh, what's the situations in 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 South Africa? 
So I wish I could say that, yes, we are prepared to handle those numbers and that we've got sufficient resources for every child with congenital heart disease. But unfortunately, the reality is not the case. Okay. So, you know, we've got our public and our private health care system. Mm-hmm. Um, and, um, and like with many things, the balance is towards the private care. So most, uh, probably about a half of the pediatric cardiology service is in private system. And therefore the public hospitals, of which there are eight public units that do pediatric cardiology and pediatric cardiac surgery, are inundated and don't have sufficient resources to cope with all the numbers. Yeah. I think even more than that is the issue of diagnosis. So the diagnosis is not only made by a pediatric cardiologist. It should be made by a general pediatrician or even, you know, at the clinic level Mm -hmm. to actually make sure that they realize that there is a cardiac problem. And if we don't have um, enough diagnoses at that level, then the person doesn't even get to um, a public service. Mm. So we're well aware that um, there is a very long waiting list for cardiac surgery. In some parts of the country, hundreds on that waiting sure. list. Um, in other parts of the country, we don't have pediatric cardiac surgeons, um, such as um, in the Northern Cape or in, in Pumalanga. And we also know that even in our setting, I work at Red Cross Children's Hospital <laughs> um, together with Tigerberg Hospital, where we are relatively well resourced we also have a very long waiting list. Mm. So this is a major issue that we would like to raise and to really bring to the attention of funders as well as to the general public that this is something that needs to have more resources. Absolutely. You guys do such great work at Red Cross and uh, Tigerberg. It's just amazing. Uh, Keep up the great work and, and, you know, to your team as well. Um, that contribute on a daily basis. Now, I would imagine, um, Professor uh, Liesel, that this is a very emotional time for parents and families that has to watch their little one go through this, um, you know, procedure to be diagnosed and things like that. I mean, is there a particular formula or way on how we can actually diagnose whether a child has a congenital heart defect? So, yes, there are certain things that we would strongly recommend. So the very first thing is um, to have an antenatal ultrasound. So we do know that when people are pregnant, they are getting ultrasounds. Probably about 80% of people at the moment get Mm -hmm. an ultrasound um, before their babies are born. But uh, the vast majority of these ultrasounds are, um, are dating ultrasounds to know how pregnant you are and to see sort of the size of the baby and whether it's a singleton or not. There is a special ultrasound that's done at around 20 weeks, which uh, when done in a particular unit, usually a hospital level unit or a private hospital level unit, focuses on every part of the baby's body and specifically looks at the heart. And we would encourage people to have that ultrasound so that we can diagnose a cardiac defect, that we can diagnose it at that point to be able to say there is a problem structurally with the heart. Instead of having four chambers, there's only three or even only two, and we can then start preparing for what needs to be done for that baby. So that's the first thing. (laughs) The second thing is at birth, Um, We obviously examine the baby and we do what we call pulse oximetry screening. So that's when I'm sure you've seen that, Mm -hmm. where you put a little probe on the foot or in adults you put it on the finger and you measure the fat. So if we do that immediately after the baby is born and there's a problem, that can also indicate congenital heart disease. And we can also do a final screening test at around 24 hours. Because sometimes at birth, everything looks good, and then 24 hours later, the issue is now being manifest. Mm. So we would really encourage that, that before a mother goes home with the baby, she asks the doctor to check the baby's heart. Uh Are you sure my baby's heart is fine? And have we had a pulse check Mm -hmm. to be able to see that the, um, the saturations in the blood or the amount of oxygen in the blood is appropriate. And then the next check is your six-week check. 
every baby has a six-week check. That's when you get your first set of immunizations outside of the hospital. And at that point, we check things like, is the baby's color good? Is the uh, heart rate good? Is the baby gaining weight? Um, is the, the temperature and the feel of the baby good? And is the baby tiring with speed? All of those things can indicate heart problems. So there's already three periods and three interventions that actually will help a very long way to making that diagnosis. Okay. Is this something that is hereditary? Is there, you know, a, is there a specific cause of how an infant picks up congenital heart defect? So the answer is yes and no. Okay. Um, so for some children, we are able to trace it to a particular cause. Okay. So, um, for example, something we don't see that often anymore is rubella or German measles. I see, yes. And when women have German measles, they can pass it onto the baby and it affects the uh, development of the heart. And so you can have heart defects. So, for example, that is one very common association. Mm-hmm. Another uh, uh, common association is Down syndrome, um, and we know that a lot of children with Down syndrome are born with heart defects. Right. But in a large majority of children, we just don't know. Mm. So um, we, we always ask those questions. Are there any children in your family or extended family that maybe have congenital heart defects? Do you as the mother or you as the father have congenital heart defects yourself? because that can also increase the chance of the baby having it. But to a large degree, it's often the first time that this happens in a family and we could not have predicted it. Yeah. It's also important to mention that there is nothing that the mother or the father would have done mm-hmm. that can cause congenital heart defects. So yeah. it's not, you know, not doing enough exercise or eating the wrong food. Um, the parents can feel well assured that if they have a child with congenital heart defects, it was, you know, that the luck of the draw and that we can't really explain why it is. Mm. You know, as a parent, you want to take away whatever, you know, <laughs> suffering the child is going through yeah. during this period. And, oh. and the blame sometime, you know, oh. is, you know, parents play the blame, blame game or they're caught up in oh. all this emotion. Um, with mm. regards to trying to make the situation better. Uh, but I'm, I'm glad you shared that with us uh, as well, Professor. We're chatting to Professor Liesel Zolke, who is uh, giving us valuable advice around congenital heart defects. Do be part of the conversation. We do have a couple of WhatsApps uh, that have come through, and I'm going to read them out very shortly. On the WhatsApp line, 786 1011 12, or if you'd prefer to call in, 0216991786. So once the diagnosis has been done and administered by a healthcare professional, um, Professor Liesel. What can we what can be done about it after that? I mean, is there a specific procedure that happens? Um, take us through how you know you would automatically treat the patient and the family at the same time. Yeah, I'm, I'm so glad you mentioned that at the end, the issue of the family. This is a family diagnosis. Yeah. Um, so often we're dealing with a baby, sometimes not even a, a baby that's not yet born because mm-hmm. we make the diagnosis early. And we always try and make that very clear that this is sometimes a long road that we're going to walk together and we're going to deal with this as a group, as a team. Um, so the family is very, very much part of the whole decision-making plan and how we take things forward. If it's a very simple defect, we do what's, again, an ultrasound. It's called an echo when you do it with of the heart, mm-hmm. and that can give you a very good impression and a very good image of what's going on with the heart. The most simple defect that you can probably um, have heard about is a, is a small hole in the heart. Yes. And we can show that to the parents, and often that is something that can close on its own. Okay. So it's um, it's important to know about it, and it's important to be sure over a period of time that it has closed on its own. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we can uh, work together. Patients come every six months or every year until we see it closed. But then we have the other group where you've got a moderate defect that needs some kind of intervention, and we have interventions that need surgery um, where we can do a more simple operation or you need have um, interventions where you need 
more complex surgery. And those are the ones that we then sit down very carefully with the family, explain what the surgical options are, um, go through surgery as a team. And then actually for many of these children, we will follow them right up into adulthood. I see. There are some children that have a smaller problem where we can fix them without surgery. So we have something called a cardiac catheterization, Mm -hmm. which is a procedure where we can close things or open things, whatever is required, from inside the body without having to do surgery. And this is a very very useful procedure. You come in the day before, you have the thing done the next day, you go home the next day, and essentially many of those are curative. Mm -hmm. Um, so we've got many options. Um, as I said, at least 95% of all of these defects can be dealt with in a way that gives you as best a quality and a longevity of life as possible. Brilliant. But the sooner we make the diagnosis, the better. Mm. Is this regarded, and I, w- I would imagine at some times people, you know, that don't work in the field or hasn't heard about congenital heart defect, would regard this as a disability? Do you find that happen? Yeah, I'm sure that is. And I think even the family sometimes see that as a disability. Mm. You can you can imagine it's an enormous thing, yeah. especially if you've got complex heart disease and where we are able to do an operation but not fix everything. So, mm-hmm. for example, if you've got a three-chambered heart, we can never make it into a four-chambered heart. We can make the flow of the blood appropriate and very, um, you know, return almost to normal, but we can never create a chamber that's not there. And so we try and work very closely with the family to uh, realize that, in fact, the child is differently abled, not disabled, Mm -hmm. and that you can adapt the quality of life to the type of heart and heart function that the child has. So we have seen, for example, adults with um, with a two-chambered heart, go on to have a family, go on to have great jobs, uh, go on to lead a very productive, even sporty lifestyle. Mm. And that's what we would encourage. Right. Again, all of this is making the diagnosis early, working together as a team, always encouraging our young patients to strive to do whatever it is they wish um, and to um, to give them all the information they needed each of the intervals of their lives so they can make the right decisions Mm -hmm. um, so that they can live as best a life as possible. We're certainly not saying that congenital heart defects means that you're disabled. It isn't the case, but you need the information and the communication to allow for that to happen. Mm. What is the burden of disease in South Africa and compared to the rest of the world as well? So it's an interesting um, question because we have much better data from the rest of the world. Um, We certainly don't have data from the rest of Africa. And from South Africa, we have some sense of the data, um, but uh, probably the numbers are not robust. So as I use the term one in a hundred, that's probably what is coming out of um, the rest of the world. And what we've seen from South Africa is people are saying, or some from Africa, people are saying, well, is it 0.5 per 100 or even less? Mm. So when we look at some of the the scientific data, you seem to think that there's less congenital heart disease in Africa and South Africa than in the rest of the world. The problem is that it's just not diagnosed and it's just not as well researched. Mm. So we just think as researchers and as practitioners in the area that we see, we would see the same amount that you would see anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. We're just missing a lot of them. I would imagine. We're chatting to Professor Liesel Zulke, who is giving us valuable advice and information around congenital heart defects. Do join us on the WhatsApp line 0786 10 11 12 or on the telephone line 0216 I do see uh, quite a few WhatsApps coming through. I'm going to address that after the break. Um, keep them coming in and uh, I'm sure Professor Liesel will try her level best to answer these questions. You're listening to Radio 786 100.4 FM.
Radio 786. Hear the difference. The time just gone 32 minutes past the hour of 8 o'clock. It's Medical Health File in association with the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa. Tonight's topic, uh, we have Professor Liesel Zolke on the line who's chatting to us about congenital heart defects. Uh, do join us on the WhatsApp line 0786 1011 12 for this extremely important um, topic and uh, information that can be passed on to our communities out there, family, friends, uh, colleagues, you name it. Uh, be part of the show on the WhatsApp line 0786 1011 12 on the telephone line 0216991786. Professor Liesel, uh, thanks very much once again for holding on and being part of the show um, uh, and, and affording us your time. No, no, it's an absolute pleasure. A couple of WhatsApps come through, uh, Professor, mm. if we could maybe go through them. Some of them we have covered some of the information, but maybe for the listeners' um, sake, if you could, you know, wouldn't mind reiterating some of that information. Um, the one says, what kind of operation can be done at a local hospital or can it be done only at private hospitals? Um, yes, thanks very much for that question. And I think it's very important to make it very clear that at our public hospitals, we are able to do the full range of operations that are also done in private hospitals. Fantastic. Um, So we have a very high-level unit at uh, Red Cross Children's Hospital, um, and similarly so in in Durban and Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. Uh, The problem is that the smaller public hospitals, for example, in Kimberley or in Free, you know, Free State has got a very good unit as well. Um, you know, they don't perhaps have those units, but our hospital does exactly the same operations that you have in private, um, and in fact have um, possibly some of the best surgeons that you can imagine to have. So the public service gives a very good service in this regard. The only problem is... Um, is the lift and the amount of people that needs to be done. Mm. So if we could double the amount of surgeries that we were able to offer, we would be really happy to do so. Mm. You took the words out of my mouth. I was going to ask about, is there a bit of a waiting list? I mean, does this type of procedure take precedent to other types of operations? So there is a waiting list, unfortunately, when it comes to congenital heart defects. Look, there is always a waiting list when it comes to surgery okay. if it's an urgent and critical operation that obviously bypasses any other surgery that's meant to be done. Um, we also try to uh, consider our surgeon. Of course. Uh, we've got two surgeons and our surgeons can also, you know, they need their rest and they also need to pace themselves. Yeah. And we can also only do so many operations per day. So we, in our hospital, we do two for the most three operations per day. Sure. So that we keep clean and we keep safe and we, uh, you know, stick to time. So, um, so there's obviously only so much you can do in certain times. Mm. And I would imagine, I I, I would imagine COVID has put a bit of a spanner in the works with regards to, uh, the time that these operations happen as well. Absolutely. But at the same time, we are very cognizant of what we call time sensitive surgery. So I think I've mentioned it several times how important the early diagnosis is. In Mm. the same way, how important is the early surgery? So although COVID has, um, you know, impacted our surgery um, uh, opportunities and our surgical list, we also have been very mindful of time sensitive surgery. And despite COVID, Mm -hmm. um, we have kept surgery going all the way through COVID time. Brilliant. So if you don't need your operation right at the moment, we've obviously paused a little bit, um, but if it's critical or very time sensitive, we've gone ahead with the surgery. Brilliant, that. brilliant, so brilliant. We really need to do it. Another one come through on the WhatsApp line, Professor. It reads as follows. Mm-hmm. It says, please ask the doctor if there's a link between a child born with a small hole in the heart and this child having a type of behavioral disorder, example, autism, or even having Down syndrome, etc. I know you alluded to it a bit earlier, but if you wouldn't mind giving that advice and information again, uh, Professor. Yes, so, so certainly Down syndrome is well known to be associated with multiple different types of 
congenital heart defects. So there's one particular type that is most common, but it can also be associated with any of the, from the small to the more complex um, congenital heart defects. What we do know is that the cells in your body that create your heart when you're in utero, those cells also migrate to other parts of the body. Mm -hmm. So um, the heart is one of the very first organs to be completed, and our hearts are actually beating, as you know, by the time you realize you're pregnant. So usually around six to seven weeks, and it's actually pumping blood around the body by that time already. Mm. And these cells are critically important. So they go up to your brain as well, they go into your face, they go into other parts of the body. And so we know that when we see heart defects, we look for other defects as well. So we see associations with facial defects. We do certainly see, as this um, listener has suggested, that we see behavioral or even um, you know, neurological or intellectual um, associations. We call them extra cardiac defects. Mm -hmm. Um, and those are very interesting because it makes us think that there may well be an additional genetic reason for developing um, cardiac defects, which we as or I as um, a researcher is very interested in. But um, this is a well-known phenomenon. And so one of the things also with the family-centered approach is that even though we fix the heart, we may have to say, let's look out and see how we do once we get to school, how we do later in life. You know, um, this could affect the whole system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks very much for that advice, uh, Professor. Another one on the WhatsApp li line reads as follows. Can Professor advise by when do they do the amniocentesis test, please? So normally an amniocentesis is from around 16 weeks onwards. And different units will do it at different times. And we would suggest that it is done in association with, for example, the scan that we mentioned. Mm -hmm. So that scan is done around 20 weeks. So if there is a concern at that scan, then they would often suggest that an amniocentesis is done as okay. well. Right. Just for the other listeners, an amniocentesis is when they take a little bit of the fluid from around the baby through a needle that goes through your tummy and checks to see what is the genetic makeup of the baby. I see. And this is, for example, if you suspect Down syndrome or another condition. Okay. Uh, last one come through uh, before we move back to some of the pertinent information is it says, how do asper infected tonsils and rheumatic uh, fever affects the heart, please? So um, that's a very good question. This is an area of great um, interest of mine. I did my PhD on a rheumatic heart disease. Okay. But it's important to know that rheumatic heart disease is a different type of heart disease. So we're talking about congenital when you're born with it. And rheumatic heart disease is something we call the acquired heart disease. Okay. So your heart was normal when you were born. You then had a sore throat and developed something called acute rheumatic fever, which is a response to the sore throat. And what your body does is then attacks its own tissues by mistake. So it tries to attack the sore throat tissues and instead it attacks the heart valve and you get a damaged heart valve, and that's mm. called rheumatic heart disease. So, yes, it definitely affects the heart, it affects the heart of children, but it is a different type of disease to congenital heart disease. Okay. All right, brilliant. We're chatting to Professor Liesel Zulka around congenital heart defects. If you have any questions, uh, you're welcome to send them through on the WhatsApp line, 786 12 Professor, what kind of research is being done? I'm sure... You know, in the last couple of years, there must there must have been so much more information that has come out of the patients that you've been treating. Um, you know, I, I would imagine that this research, uh, you know, tries to be as current and possibly a worldwide sort of network that shares information. Absolutely. I mean, there are wonderful networks in the pediatric cardiology um, community, and in particular within the country and within the continent. Um, and we try and share information to try and improve the outcome um, for all of our patients. 
And I think the research spans all the way from the bench to the bedside. Mm. So from bench work, we're talking about laboratory work. So mm-hmm. we're involved in looking at the genetics of congenital heart disease by actually looking very carefully at the genes and trying to see whether there is any genetic inheritance and how we can potentially deal with that. We then move all the way through to diagnosis. So how do we make these diagnoses? Um, For example, there was a lot of research around pulse oximetry screening to be able to show without any doubt that this was a good way of making the diagnosis very early on. It was um, cost-effective and it was of a very high sensitivity and specificity. These are numbers that we use to say that a test is very good. Mm-hmm. Then you've actually got the whole issue of intervention. So how do we say that this particular thing that we're doing is helping our patients? So we check it, we research it, we audit it, we audit our practice, and many times we audit our practice and say to ourselves, well, this intervention, which we did 20 years ago, is no longer the right one. We need to actually move a little bit more rapidly into the current era. And we know if we continue to do this old operation, it's not good for our patients. Mm. So we are constantly doing that. We're personally involved in multiple research projects. I direct the Children's Heart Disease Research Unit. And our major aim always is family-centered accountable research which improves quality of life and then long term is the issue of grown-up congenital heart disease so these patients grow up 95 percent of them are amenable to surgery and will grow into adulthood and so we also have to look at the long term it's not just the operation today but what will happen after five years after 10 years after 30 years so that we can make sure that they grow up to be um, adults that can have a full range and quality Brilliant. of life. So Brilliant. research is happening all the time. Brilliant. Another one comes through on the WhatsApp line, reads as follows. Thank you very much for a valuable program. Thank you to Professor for coming on board. Um, can you live a normal life with congenital heart disease? I think you just, just, um, answered that, but, um, I would imagine. Our no, but, co- it, but it's worth reiterating. Yeah, absolutely. As you say, absolutely is the answer. We're both saying the same thing here. Um, but what we always do is remind people of what we mean by normal life. So we mean a a normal life where you do not ever smoke, Mm. where you don't become overweight, where you keep exercising because it's a very special heart that you have. Mm -hmm. You were born with this very special heart. We want to keep it as special as possible. So we encourage all the normal things, but we also say that we need to exercise that type of caution. So we spend a very detailed time speaking right from the time that children are at school all the way through especially during the teenage years about all of those kind of things so that we make sure that they really stay healthy that they understand what their lesion is or was and that they create their life around it but actually making sure that they're looking after themselves okay Another one on the WhatsApp line. It seems like it's an extremely popular topic, and, and we thank you once again, Professor, for uh, coming on board and sharing some, such light into this area of congenital uh, heart disease or heart defects. Uh, what is the most common um, congenital heart defect in adults? Mm, that's a good question because remember that every adult who's got a congenital heart defect was born with it. Yeah. So it's essentially the same that you would say during childhood. It's a small hole in the heart. And if you think of the heart as having a a house with four rooms in it, Mm -hmm. um, and you've got two small rooms at the top uh, divided by a wall and two larger rooms at the bottom divided by a wall. And so when we talk about a hole in the heart, it's usually a little hole in that wall dividing the two rooms, either in the top of the heart or in the bottom of the heart. So the most common defect in the world is a little hole in the bottom part of the heart called a ventricular septal defect or a VSD. Mm -hmm. And many of them can close on their own um, because it is in a muscle. And so, of course, as the muscle grows, um, you can kind of imagine that it can, you know, sort of close up the hole on its own. Uh, What we do see, though, in adults 
is we see much less of those because, of course, those may have closed already during childhood. Mm -hmm. But in the same token, um, many adults get to their 20s or 30s and then perhaps only then discover that they were actually born with a hole. But then normally that is a very small one and doesn't cause any problems. Okay. Great advice. Thanks very much for that. So I would imagine, Professor, that a a child that has gone through the process of having an operation, gone through the process of being monitored through his or her lifestyle, that their lifestyle, I would imagine, when they all grown up, would also need to still be monitored, need to still be careful that they don't slip back and you know, land in land up into in, in hospital again, I would imagine, Professor. You, you're absolutely right. Um, it depends. Um, if it's a small lesion, if something is closed and it's been totally sorted out, we're quite happy to discharge patients where we know there's going to be no long-term consequence. So if you've had a tiny little hole in the heart, it's closed now. We've double-checked it. Everything is fine. We're very happy to discharge you. But somebody that you described now has had surgery. We always suggest that they stay very closely in contact with their um, cardiac team. Some of them we know we followed that particular operation for 50, 60 years, and so we know what is coming. We know what can happen after 15 years. We know what can happen after 30 years. So there's a reason for those patients coming to see us on a regular basis. Mm. Other operations are relatively new. They're only 10 years old. So we don't even know what's going to happen after 15 years. So mm. we also, for those patients, want them to stay in very close contact with the hospital. And so we have now what we call grown-up congenital heart disease units. There's one at Krutisker, one at Tigerberg Hospital. There are some other parts of the country where we actually focus on adults with congenital heart disease or heart disease acquired in childhood and then follow them up appropriately as well. Mm -hmm. Give them the right advice about sport, the right advice about pregnancy, the right advice about their occupation. You know, for some of them, they can do whatever they want, but for others, perhaps um, being a pilot or being in the Navy or being a Springbok rugby player is not necessarily mm -hmm. the right thing for their heart. Got it. So we also have to, um, to give them that advice going forward. Great. Um, another WhatsApp coming through. It reads as follows. A Down syndrome child with a hole in her heart and doesn't have any symptoms. Is there anything to look out for in her upbringing? Um, I think that that's an important one because the comment there was that there's no symptoms. And that's very important. When the heart defect, whatever it is, um, is significant, there normally are symptoms. The child gets tired, you're not going weight well, you're not eating, you're not able to exercise. And those are the things that one has to look out for. But if you've got a small defect with no symptoms and you have, you know, obviously had a medical check where they've been happy just to monitor it, then, then we're happy to do that. And I think, you know, I've got lots of patients like that where you say, look, it's a very small hole. It's not going to cause any problems. Just keep monitoring. But if there's any problems, come back to me anytime. Okay. And I think the person who sent that probably has heard that from their doctor, and I would um, always encourage that. I think the one thing to say is that every heart is different. Every child is different. Every hole is different. Mm. And so often what I've heard is, well, my cousin or auntie or friend also had a hole in their heart, and that one closed on its own. I'm sure the same thing will happen to you know this patient or my child. It doesn't necessarily mean it's the same thing. Mm. So please check with your doctor first because everybody is different and we have to tailor make the intervention and the management for this particular child and this particular disease. Mm. Um, you know, all too often we find that Dr. Google plays a huge role in <laughs> how people want to diagnose or want to find out whether they have a particular illness mm. problem and things like that do you caution and, and warn against that and and uh, what is your advice i don't caution or warn against it but i do say that you need to discuss it with your medical doctor i see more and more of our patients coming in with their google diagnosis um and and it's wonderful that parents and families are interested and they want to know what's going on but it's often that it could give them much more cause for alarm than they need to or less 
alarm when they should have. And so I value that interaction and for them to have looked it up really is a, shows me what kind of interest and energy you're going to get from this family and the commitment, but it's a good thing to discuss it with okay. your doctor. Brilliant. Um, Brilliant especially advice. when it comes to taking medicines or not taking medicines. Another one, quick one on the WhatsApp line. Uh, could you explain heart disease acquired by mothers after childbirth? Yes, so I think what we're talking about there is a thing called peripartum cardiomyopathy. And this is a heart disease where your heart muscle fails in and around pregnancy. It's a very unusual symptom, a very unusual condition. And it is thought to be that somehow the pregnancy hormones affects the muscle of the heart. And so towards the end of the pregnancy, the, the mum starts to really struggle and actually often after pregnancy, up to about six weeks after, our heart can actually fail um, and fail quite severely. So we also remind mothers that are listening that, you know, we all feel a bit tired after we've had our baby. If it really is that you're very unwell after you've had your baby, even once you've been discharged, you shouldn't still have shortness of breath and tiredness please go and see a doctor. It's a critical situation. It can be well easily treated, but if we don't recognize it, it can be very severe. Professor Liesl Zolka, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. Thank you very, very much for all the great uh, advice you've given tonight around congenital heart defects. To you and your team at Red Cross Hospital, thank you for all that you do for our communities, and uh, we look forward to linking up with you in the near future. It's a real pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. A pleasure. Have a great evening. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. That's how we end Medical Health File in association with the Islamic Medical Association of South Africa. Radio 786. Hear the difference.